I think first they probably, did you formulate the shape or the, or the pattern first? Make that shape. Yeah. And he makes the, uh, the yeah. So this is all, yeah, so this is a collaboration. He was saying that Jim is really well known for these canes. These, uh, these glass rods that we're using, these are called canes. So each cane is a decorative uh, band of colored glass with clear over top of it. And what you see uh, Jeff doing is he's laying out a pattern, and we're going to roll that up on a bubble. Now, we have one going on over here. This is the second one. Uh, we're kind of doing production style this weekend so we can make a lot of work. Uh, we made, I think, nine of these giant bubbles yesterday, and uh, I think that was a pretty good day. Um, so these guys already have one rolled up. We're getting the next one prepared, so we start out with them cold. We're going to stick them in an oven called an annealer to heat them up to 900 degrees. Then we can pull them out of the annealer and put them in the reheating furnace, which is called a glory hole, to fuse this pattern together. So it's kind of like tack fused. So then we can take clear glass and roll it up on the bubble. Now, if I say any terminology you don't understand, just get my attention and I'll try to explain it. But um, we're going to be live streaming here, I think, really soon. Uh, we're, we're live right now. Yeah. So. Uh, if you're at home, you can uh, tune in to cmog.org, and we have a live stream on our website. And uh, so anywhere in the world can watch it right now. So anybody listening at home, you can ask Amanda any question you'd like, and she'll ask us, and we'll, we'll get back to you. So usually all of our friends from around the country tune in, especially, I would say, from the, from the West Coast, but right now they're sleeping. Uh, you know how those guys are. They sleep in on Sundays. We get up and we go to work. Right, Jeff? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if you want to see some of Jeff's work, he has a piece up in the, the new wing here. And uh, they're candlesticks. Right, Jeff? Yeah. They're candlesticks that are shaped like a snake. And I, I think there's a, a, a grouping of them of maybe six or eight or maybe more. Yeah. Go, you should go look at your work. <laughs> Anyways, that's in our new wing up here. And, uh, yeah, you want to check that out. So... Tom is taking the left over here, so you saw us break off that big giant bubble. Well, there's still some of that pattern left up on the pipe. Uh, the glass on the iron is called the moil, and usually that's waste glass. So if you're making production glass, usually you just toss that in the can. But because there's a lot of time and effort into making all of this decorative cane, we're going to use as much of that as we possibly can. So Tom's closing the end of it, and we're going to blow a small bubble, and Jeff's going to do the same thing, and he'll group these things together. Uh, he actually has a show coming up down in uh, uh, Miami. And uh, they're going to make a, a large room with all of these hanging things. They're going to actually end up being, uh, I, I hate to say lighting, they're going to be lit orbs. So I can't wait to see what they look like all together. All the patterns that he's done, he's got some white cane and he's got some black cane, kind of the same technique and the same patterns, uh, but they look totally different. We have a pot of white milky glass melted over here in this far tank. So uh, Jason, this is Jason Christian sitting at this bench. He's actually one of the full-time uh, glass makers along with Jim that work with uh, Dale Chihuly. How about a big uh, hand of applause for these guys. They're going to be working hard today. And yours, you guys. <laughs> so uh, we're going we're gonna to be chatting uh, a little bit and working a lot. So if you guys have any questions, get my attention, and uh, we'd, we'll try to answer them for you. Are there any questions so far? How many of you guys have seen glass making before? A couple. Have you seen it to this scale? Usually this scale is like there's a few shops around the country that make, make glass like this. And, and Jim's team, they make it like this every day. So if you walked in to buy your ticket and you saw that big uh, uh, standing floor chandelier called the Big Green Fern, that's one of Dale Chihuly's designs. And most likely Jim and Jason worked on that. So... They work in his shop every day. Any questions yet, Amanda? How many people are watching? 75 people. Well, thanks for tuning in. I think that this is a pretty, pretty cool shot here. When you're looking up on the monitor and you're seeing this, this is a uh, view inside of our reheating furnace. So we have a camera on the back of it that allows us to look through it because it's got a piece of glass called fused silica that's protecting the camera from the intense heat. 
And that few silica was actually developed right here in Corning in the 1930s. So there's not too many places you can see inside of a glassmaker's furnace like this. But this is a really close-up view of the piece that Jason's starting. You can see all those canes fused together that make that pattern. So right now the pattern is very small and dense, but you'll see as we inflate it and blow it up, it gets much larger. So just a little bit to talk about the technique, too, that we're going to be using. Uh, it's kind of a German-style technique where we're going to blow up a, a pretty thick bubble into kind of a bullet shape, but it's going to have a constriction already in it called the jack line. Tom is adding the jack line right now off the end of the iron. Now, every piece that we make has to have a jack line in order to break it off of the blowpipe. If it doesn't have a jack line, it's not going to break off. It'll end up breaking and shattering and... Uh, not coming off in a whole piece. So that's a very important step. And you're going to notice early on when we're doing this that Jim will put the jack line in uh, to the second to the last gather. So the final gather, it'll already have a jack line in it, and he's going to do what's called a post gather, which is a gather over 90% of the bubble. He'll leave maybe inch and a half, two inches away from the gather line, and that way he can gather a lot more glass without having to worry about the jack line already being in there. It'll already be in there, it's gonna break off very easily, and it makes the process much more uh, easy for us as far as like, you know, trying to break it off the iron. You'll, you'll understand when, when we get to that part. We're getting pretty close. Jason's already got his piece uh, almost finished. We're gonna take it over on this bench and we're gonna do the final uh, steps over here and then Jason's gonna start the next one. So this is how production usually you know, uh, works. We'll have two benches, one starting it, one finishing it. All right, we have a question. The difference between soda lime and crystal. The difference between soda lime and crystal. Anybody in the audience wanna Feel this question? Do you guys know what we're talking about? It's the type of glass that we're using. So this type of glass that we're using in our furnace is called soda lime glass, which is the most common glass in the world. Even this window glass here is soda lime glass. But the type we're using is compatible with all of the color glass that we're using. So we used to actually have a working glass factory right here in this building called the Stuben Glass Factory. And a lot of people refer to that glass as crystal. Well, it's because they used lead oxide in the glass to make that. So that's when people refer to, oh, that's crystal or that's soda lime. So that's the difference. Uh, just the, the recipe in the glass. Does that, does that answer their question? All right, perfect. So we're going to get ready to beat up this ball here. Jeff's got these uh, paddles. These are cork paddles, and it allows him to shape the glass while it's still very hot. So these are sculptural bubbles, so he doesn't want to work in the round. We blow them up round, and then he pushes in. And this is what's really cool about glass, is you can really see how you can shape and manipulate it when it's the right temperature. So this is ready for the next gather. We're going to gather this up, and then we're going to start that uh, to make it into the post. All right, I'm going to put some gloves on, and we're going to put this bubble away. So all of the pieces that we make have to be cooled down slowly. And uh, we're going to put them into an oven called the annealer to slowly cool down them. To slow, let me, I'm too close to the mic, I think. So it cools them down slowly so they don't crack and break. 
think I can put that right in the front, Chris, right next to the one. Yeah, I think so. Can you just pop that real quick? Take a quick look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right over there in the corner. So our ovens that we're loading into are over here. We actually loaded all the ovens yesterday, so they're full of glass. So we're coming to this bench because then it's not too far to, to carry across the floor. All right, into the box. All right. On to the next piece. All right, so we're going to get started on this. I'm going to actually take the mic off. But again, if you have any questions, just get my attention. All right, so we'll be seeing a lot of teamwork throughout this, and you'll see how um, not one person could do a project like this. It takes the leadership of Jeff and Jim to create a piece like this, but nearly impossible for them to do on their own. So you'll continually see our teamwork of the team of Corning working with uh, Jeff and Jim, but they're the ones in charge of the piece, so it might look like um, everybody's involved, but everybody has a role on the team, and the team is being led by Jeff and by Jim. So they're the conductors, if you will. They're telling you know the team what to do and when to do it so that you kind of see how everything came together when we did that last gather. We put the piece away. And then almost right away, they had glass back in their hand. And that's that well-orchestrated teamwork of them saying, OK, this is what we need to do, and this is when we need to do it. Um, so over on the, the far side, we can see Jason and Chris getting started on the next piece. All right, so they're gathering up a little bit of actually white glass, a beautiful opaline glass that the studio mixed up and melted for us, so we appreciate that. And then as you see, the George comes back to the bench, hands it off to Jim, and Jim asked Tom to, to inflate it. We've got Josh here shielding the gaffer. The gaffer is the glass blower on the team, in this case, Jim, gaffing the piece. Uh, it looks like I'm going to go help out over with the cane. So I'm going to be back in a moment. But again, enjoy the live stream. Enjoy the demonstration. And have a great Sunday.
right, so they're heating up the very top of the piece. You saw them using the torch to actually get it even hotter. George is over at the furnace, 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. You'd think it'd get plenty hot in there, but in glass making, it's all about temperature management, understanding where the heat is, why it's there, and where you need it hot, and of course, where you need it hotter. So they use the torch on the top of the piece where they'll start the jack line. And it looks like right now the camera's on Jason and Chris. Jason, are, Jason and Chris are heating up the cane work. There you can see now Chris using a very similar torch to heat the very middle of the cane. When you go into the furnace, when you go into the glory hole, the heat, there's two burners in our furnace. And so two spots naturally get a little hotter than the rest. So Chris uses that torch and he heats it all so it's very even. We need to take this cane work and actually wrap it around the bubble that Jason's papering at the bench. He is using a newspaper, folded up newspaper. We keep that tool wet. It allows him to shape the glass with the palm of his hand. He's measuring the bubble right now. He's using a pie divider. And more or less, when you roll that cane up around the bubble, you need to take a measurement. You want it to be, it's about a third pie, 3.14. So we measure the bubble. We measure the cane, and we can make them according. So we can make them so that they'll, they'll roll right up. All right, we've got a great shot into the furnace, into the glory hole, the glory hole cam. And you can see George heating it up. He brings it over, and they'll squeeze in that jack line where they were torching earlier so that they can squeeze it. These beautiful lights need to come off of the blowpipe perfectly. And to come off of the blowpipe, they need that jack line, that constriction right off the end of the pipe. Continuing to use that torch, continuing to use the jacks, squeezing it in. Again, it has to be absolutely perfect for that clean break, and they know through experience. Jimmy squeezing in that jack line, George turning the pipe, Josh Lobbs is shielding Jimmy from the intense heat coming off of the piece. And Tom Ryder is ready to blow and inflate if they need to. Great teamwork, great coordination. All right, over on our side, we'll. Jason will be doing the roll-up right now. He touches the bubble down and rolls up the cane. There it goes. Wow, look at that. Nailed that one. Textbook. Beautiful. So, gee, this is what I was telling the crowd about. So we have a jack line in this piece now. So you saw us put that really tight constriction in, and that's going to allow us to break that off easily at the end. So. Like I said, he's gonna gather up over 95% of this, just leaving about an inch and a half, two inches, right where the, the gather line is. Now we would call that a post dip, right? You're kind of dipping on that post? Yeah, yeah post, post gather. Dip. A post gather, wonderful. Well, this will be exciting to see gathering more glass on that. I, if you're wondering how heavy it is, Oh, it's probably, what, 15, 18 inches long. It's maybe seven inches tall there. Now imagine a boulder, imagine a rock about the size of a, when you're picking through the bin and you're looking for the largest watermelon in the bin, that's probably about the size right there. Now we're gonna gather more glass right on top of that. Amazing. You see how they stop turning just briefly and momentarily. It's telling them the temperature. If we see it moving around, we know that it's fairly hot. As it cools, when they stop turning, it stops moving. And they have to judge that perfect temperature to gather again. What happens is if you gather too hot, 
that bubble on the inside can collapse in on itself. And I've seen it before where you gather, it's too hot, and actually the glass, all that hard work, that glass kind of falls back into the furnace, just destroying the work that you did and contaminating all the glass in the furnace. Well, you think, I'll just gather really cold. I'll let the glass cool well under 1,000 degrees. The problem there, the glass actually cracks and breaks. It'll blow up. Not good. Not good to have the glass breaking into the furnace. OK, you can see the, now we call that the farm equipment. I'm not sure if there is a proper name or a better name, but I love the name. That's, we've got the farm equipment out. And this will allow them to, I mean, again, this is a very, very heavy piece, and it's about to get even heavier. So rather than lifting it up, work smarter, not harder. We've created this yoke system. This allows us to just simply slide the glass bubble right into the furnace. There he is turning and winding. You can see all the torque he has on that pipe, turning it. Oh. He'll pull the glass out of the surface, pull the bubble out of the surface there, like gathering honey, a giant honey pot. Okay, there he goes. You can see the glass. See the glass in there? It's dripping off the end. Okay, he pulls it out. George and Jim working in perfect coordination to steer the farm equipment, to steer the glass. And what they'll do, the first thing they'll want to do is cool that blowpipe. That blowpipe is going to be extremely hot for being in the furnace. Extremely hot, so they'll cool it down. Smart. All right, we've got some questions so from the live stream. Wonderful. What does Coast Gather? Can they hear more about that? Gathering after a jack line is set is dangerous to the peace? Question mark? So the question is about the post gather. Can I hear more about it? Gathering after the jack line, is that dangerous? Well, it's actually very beneficial in this case because, again, we have to break the piece free from the blowpipe. The, the gather that we make has to have that jack line. It has to have that constriction in it. So right now, imagine all the glass that they have here having to turn it. Remember all that hard work you saw them turning the pipe, George, Tom, turning the blowpipe, Jim, turning the pipe, all that torque. Be very difficult to put that jack line in right now with all the weight and of course all of the heat radiating off of that bubble. So it could be even more dangerous to try to put the jack line in now. Could be dangerous to uh, the glass makers having to turn it, to Jim having to deal with the heat coming off of the piece. So when you make a large piece like this, uh, sometimes it's beneficial to put that jack line in and then do the post gather. Now, I was talking with uh, the artists about the final piece, and the final piece is going to be lighting. They will cut away some of the bottom of the piece, and so that jack line, that gather line, actually all that gets removed, so you don't even see that in the final piece. It all gets removed, and so this is a very great and safe way to make a piece this large. The Wonderful. I hope that helps. The canes that they have are gorgeous, wonderful. About how Jim made those. Can you talk a little bit about how Jim made these? Well, I was talking with Jim and Jason and Jeff yesterday, and they said that they pulled most of these canes out in Seattle. So they worked together, and they actually worked as a team. There was quite a, a large team, just like we have a, a large team today. They had about five different people all working together to make these cane. And the type of glass color they're using is, it's called Duro. It's a glass that's very uh, intense. It's a glass that as you stretch it, it gets thin, but it doesn't, what we would consider bleed. The line stays crisp. The line stays sharp. Now they'll take and make one cane, so they'll take some of that Duro glass, covered in clear. Imagine the size of maybe a, a soup can, a large hearty soup can stretching that glass thin till it's about the diameter of a pencil. So the inside of that pencil, where you think maybe the lead would be, and then you've got the wood on top of it. In our case, the inside of the cane is that Duro color, that straight color, and then clear glass on top of it. Now, once they stretch it out, we're talking, you know, 30 feet long, the length 
of the shop. It's about the diameter of a pencil. You cut it up until it's about the size of a pencil. Now I'll step over to the canes here, and boy, there's probably... Jeff, what do you think? How many different styles of cane do you think there are here? There's probably 20 or 30. Okay, and then there's the white ones and the black ones as well. Okay, so there's 20 or 30 different styles, and they're in white and in black. Yeah. Fantastic. So that gives you a lot of options as the artist. Is there anything that you're looking for when you're putting these patterns together? Um, the, the most organic kind of shapes and, and colors together. And But we began with some very traditional um, cane techniques and shapes just to pay tribute to the past and the Venetian tradition, and then kind of abstracting from there. Excellent. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah, so once the pattern is together, once you have that cane, what we might call filigrana, once you have that cane, it's endless, the possibilities. Think of like DNA helixes, how that spiral and twist, and then just the variations that can be made from there. Sometimes when I think of something beautiful, I think of a flower, and I think of a different types of flower. Well, there's tens of types of different flowers in your garden. You go to another garden, there you see a hundred more types of flowers. And it's the same idea, I think, with cane. You've got all these beautiful different types of cane. Oh, yep, here we go. All right, I'm going to get off the microphone and help Jason create the starter bubble. Again, thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for joining us on Sunday. We'll be right back. Right, she's she's tuned out, turned out, but I'm gonna tune in. So we're just getting ready to do the final shaping on this big bubble. So Tom's gonna give it a heat. Jim's been torching the back, and uh, we're gonna start to blow it up from the backside all the way to the front. So you'll see Tom and me working together to turn it, and uh, Jim's papering it so he can tell the bubble where to to inflate. If he's holding the paper on a certain area, it's going to cool it down and not blow it up so much. My favorite question. How much does it weigh? How much does it weigh? Last time we got this question, Jim, we had to like put it on a scale to show everybody. Yeah, I'd say I'd say 350, 350 pounds. That's what I would say. So. <laughs> All right, we're going to get ready to blow this up. I'm going to help Tom turn. Ready for the breath of life. Take a heat, Tom. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right, I got her. All right, Jim says one more heat. To me and Tom have been swapping out so one person doesn't have to handle all the load. All right, open. Got her? We're getting close.
Uh, that's okay, Tom. Open. All right, so you can see that Jim has been using that newspaper tool to help shape that sphere as they're inflating it. Um, and sometimes they've been using a torch on the backside of the bubble, and that's just to sort of heat up that area a little bit more. When we blow into a pipe, that air pressure is going to follow the, the least resistant path, and that's the hottest or the softest glass. So if you want to stop the bubble from blowing out in an area, you can sort of chill it, or you can hold a tool there like that newspaper is very effective. Or you can help sort of heat up the other areas using that fluffy torch that's running on propane. And it looks like they're pretty close to the volume that they're looking for. Jeff is gearing up in his, uh, he's got an aluminized apron, some big Kevlar sleeves. He'll probably put a face shield on, and then he'll use those big cork paddles. So once we get this sphere inflated to the volume, he goes in there and starts to push in to certain areas and create these little craters or these dimples in the bubble, distorting it as he wants. So this is a lot of fun to watch. Cork is a really nice material to shape glass with. It's very soft. Uh, you can really get in there and sort of rub on the, the bubble with the cork, push into it pretty hard, and you won't leave any tool marks. You won't scuff it or leave any scratches on it. You can see we're starting to get to the maxed out size of that glory hole. We have a couple big doors on the outside. They're those sliding doors. So we can work a pretty large scale and continue to fit in and out of that. So now they've been turning the entire time very smoothly to keep everything perfectly on center and even. That's very important when you're creating a nice form like this. But you'll start to see him stop and flip a couple different ways now. This will give Jeff just a few seconds to get in there and make some squeeze marks with those corks. But you'll notice this bubble is going to start to slump towards the ground. And as it does, the more it slumps, the harder it is to turn it back up. So that's why we get two guys on the blowpipe, George and Jim. They're both applying a lot of torque to keep that really uh, in, the, in the center realm there. The more that slumps off center, the harder it is for those guys to turn it back. And they've got maybe 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds at the most to really get the, the shaping with the corks. As that bubble's gotten blown up larger, it's gotten quite thin. And the thinner it gets, the less time you have to manipulate the material. So it's a lot more frequent reheating at this point. So you can see the, the production flow that's really starting here. Uh, G. Brian and Jason are over here. They got that start bubble with the cane. Jason twisted the cane after going into a mold a couple times, a uh, technique called Merletto. So it creates an extra little dimension of twist with those canes, and it creates a really beautiful effect when it blows out. So once this final piece, or this piece is finalized and done, we'll put it away into the annealer, and these guys should have the next start coming their way. So we can just roll right into it. And you have to remember that if you see any type of movement in the glass, it is over 1,000 degrees. So at 1,000 Fahrenheit, that glass is completely rigid. It has no more movement to it. So when they come out of that oven, I'm guessing it's around maybe 14, 1,500, right around there. But that's why Jeff's got all that gear on. That's a lot of heat coming off of that sphere. So these are going to be lighting fixtures. We made, I think, about eight of these, maybe eight or nine of these yesterday, all the same scale. We're going to crank out probably just as many today. And these are going down to Art Basel in Miami. So it's going to be an installation. It's a collaboration between Jeff Zimmerman, the guy in red, and Jim Mongrain. So it looks like we're pretty close. George is the one that's been carrying these pieces into the annealer, where they need to slowly cool. So at some point, you'll see him get geared up here to catch this. And we'll get it into that oven. It'll take about 16 hours for a piece like this to properly anneal. The time frame of slow cooling in glass is mostly dependent on how thick a piece is. And this is pretty thin. Even though it's a very large piece, 16 hours should be plenty of time for it. 
If the glass cools too fast, it'll crack. We really have a nice setup on this larger bench with our jumbo glory hole. This yoke that they're using, the rollers, it's an invested track. So when we had our amphitheater built, that was one very important detail that we asked for with the crew was to lay these tracks down, invest it into the floor so it's a much lower profile. Um, and that tra the, the rollers set right in there nicely and you can move that back and forth, just giving yourself a little bit of an easier time when you have to get back to the bench and the glory hole. Now, George is putting on a lot of extra gear. Even the Kevlar gloves will burn through, especially when you're holding on to a big, heavy piece of glass like this. So George likes to put on this extra hoodie, just a little extra uh, protection for him. And then he'll put those aluminized sleeves on, the big Kevlar mittens, and a face shield. Are you guys coming back over here? Yeah, we're, we're going to carry it over there and break okay. it off. Yep. So we're going to get closer to the annealer that we're using, which is over on this side of the stage. You can imagine when you grab a hold of a 1,000 degree giant piece of glass, you don't want to walk too, too far with it. We'll limit the distance here so these guys will come grab this bench to break it off. I hope not. Well, when we break this off, we've been fire polishing the break off. Anytime you break glass, even if it's 1,000 degrees, it leaves a very jagged edge. Uh, so we like to fire polish that for a couple of reasons. One is it actually just takes away that dangerous edge. So if you handle this piece later on, you won't cut yourself on the break off. But it also kicks a little bit of extra heat right there. And that's generally the coldest section of the bubble when we break it free. And adding some extra heat with this hot torch will just limit any chances of it cracking or breaking. Uh, into the object. Do you want the left side again, George, or the right? Both. both. All right, you got it. So Jim's using a diamond file dipped in water. He scores that constriction. That's why that constriction line is so important. We need this to break free very easily right here. A little tap does it at the right moment. There's that quick fire polish, and away this one will go until tomorrow afternoon sometime. Gets it in there safe and sound. I say we give a big round of applause to these guys for a beautiful effort. Another amazing piece of glass designed by Jeff Zimmerman. Collaboration with Jim Mongrain. We've got the whole team here helping out. Nice work. All right, so we're just going to continue rolling right on into the next. Does anybody here have any questions about the process? We're here working with these guys all day long. We're probably going to break for lunch sometime around noon, but we'll be in here all afternoon making the same objects, just keeping this rotation going. Um, and this is our live stream event right now, too. So until noon, we are broadcasting this online. And if you want to check back into that, there's a couple ways you can do it. I like to go to YouTube and go to the CMONG page on YouTube, the, the channel. Corning Museum of Glass, or you can actually go to our main website, cmog.org, and there should be a window right when that pops up, and just hit play, and you'll see the live feed of what's happening in here.
All right. Well, hello, everybody, again, and uh, welcome to anybody that's tuned in with us online here at our live streaming event. We've got a lot going on in our amphitheater. We've got Jeff Zimmerman. He's a glassmaker designer, and he's putting together these beautiful patterns with Kane. He's brought his team along with him to help make these really large globes that get distorted at the very end. We've got Jim Mongrain right now that's setting up the beginning of one of these pieces. G. Brian, uh, George Kennard are helping to turn the pipe here. Jason Christian's been working on rolling the canes up and getting the pattern all set and ready for the next gathers. And that brings us to this step. So we're creating a post bubble right now. We have a lot of beautiful cane. This one I think was twisted up a little bit. We have some opaline white glass mixed in. And Jim's in the process of getting this set up. He'll put a little constriction in here, a jack line on this post bubble. And then we'll let it set up and dip back into our furnace to gather more glass on there so we have enough material to inflate this to the size they're looking for. We have two stations going right now. On the other side of our stage, Tom Ryder and Josh Labs are working on a, a little globe, a small globe. We had some leftover material from the last piece, enough cane in the leftover on the moil to create another little globe out of it. So they're working on that right now. But this next move that Jim's going for, this is that jack line. So he's got a tool called jacks. It's a bladed tool. He's preheated, put a little bit of wax on there and squeezing over the bubble, forming a nice clean constriction. This is a very important step. When we go to remove anything from the blowpipe, we have to break the glass free. And anybody that's broken glass, you probably know it doesn't like to break in a clean edge. So we're gonna tell it to break in a very clean line by incorporating this line into it. And you can see how much torque G is really applying to turning that blowpipe, keeping everything on center. Very, very difficult. The team you're watching right now is highly skilled. Jim can use that propane torch just to kick a little extra temperature into that area. Especially using these metal tools, the metal pulls heat out of the glass and the heat is what keeps it soft and able to manipulate. So a little extra heat with that torch can help out to get these little details to work smoothly. So this is pretty much the setup. This is the post bubble. They'll just kind of hang out, let this get to the right temperature. And once it's dropped down to about 1,000 degrees where it's totally rigid, it'll be stable enough to dip back into our furnace and get another gather of glass.
All right, this is the big blow here. You can see them really inflating it. George giving it all he's got. It takes a lot of breath to blow up a piece like this. They'll do it in maybe three heats, two, three, four heats. I think maybe that's the first or second one. We've been over here heating up the cane again for the next project. Jimmy using the torch on the back end. We saw him using the torch earlier where he was cutting in the jack line. Looks like he's heating the shoulder of the piece there. That doesn't make it any easier for George who has to turn this with the torque on the pipe there. The hotter it is in the back, the more difficult it can be to, to actually turn it and of course to keep it on center. That glass wants to really flop around. You can see, you see it moving around in the the glory hole is as he switches directions. And when he comes out, I don't know if the camera will change right to George, but you'll see it takes a lot of oomph. Look at this, lifting it up, getting it back on, and Tom gets right in there right away. He knows. All right, so George stepped back, blowing it out now. Of course, Jim and Jeff, they're the ones saying, blow a little harder, give it all you got, whatever it needs. Josh putting a little bit of air on the very bottom. I see Jeff there. They've got some shielding involved. A lot of heat coming off that piece. Boy, look at it spin. You see how it's getting bigger? Amazing. I love that part. Quick eye. That was a good one. George gets it back onto the yoke. Now, once it gets really big and really hot, they'll actually leave it on that yoke. They won't bring it back and forth to the bench. It's just, it's too much. I mean, you can see the size of this piece the size of that furnace, the size of the team, all working together. Okay, here they go again, bringing it back. Now they'll set it on rollers, a piece this big, this heavy. They won't wanna slide this back and forth. They, wanna, they don't wanna roll it on the bench rails. Normally when we make a piece, we can roll it back and forth, but a piece like this, once you've got that momentum, you see how it's turning and turning and turning? Once you've got that momentum, trying to stop and switch directions, oh boy, not gonna happen on a piece like this. So they wisely put it onto those rollers so they can continually turn in one direction. Wow, has that gotten big? There must be a lot of heat coming off that piece. Looks like George taking a well-deserved break. Tom Ryder on the pipe. Again, using that torch. Now I see Jeff getting suited up. Jeff's got all that protective equipment on. He's about to get up close and personal with that bubble. He's gonna put the touches, the artistic touch onto the bubble to make it into the perfect light. Oop. Jason's over here. He's about to do the roll up. About to roll up the cane. A lot of action in the hot shop this morning. A lot of action going on. Okay, on our end, I'm seeing the, the bubble picking up the cane. Wow, another perfect roll up. Absolutely perfect. Amazing to be watching this this Sunday morning right here in the amphitheater, the beautiful amphitheater here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Welcome everybody online, listening, watching. We've got a lot of folks here in the amphitheater watching this live. If you've never been to the museum, you should definitely plan a trip. If you're watching online and you've seen all of the different live streams, you see all the events, you go on to cmog.org, you've seen our YouTube channel, you probably follow us on Facebook, you follow us on Instagram, come on out to the museum. Plan a trip. Summertime, time to travel. Watch the action live, like what you're watching right now. You're watching Jeff with those cork paddles pressing in. Look at them burn, they're on fire, folks. They're on fire. That's why he's got that protective equipment on. Imagine, imagine that. Standing that close, the smoke coming off those paddles. Back to that furnace. Now you can see them opening up that furnace. 2100 degrees blasting out quite the experience you don't have to get this close you can watch 
from the seats. You can even try this. Well, you can't try this, but you can try something. You can make yourself a beautiful flower. You can make an ornament. You saw them inflating that great big bubble. Wouldn't you like to try that? You can inflate an ornament. You can pinch and pull the glass into a flower. Maybe you want to stay a little further away from the heat. You can make a bead. While you're with your project, making a bead or a flower, the kids can make sandblasted cups and bowls. The kids can make their own wind chimes. They can make a beautiful picture frame for the family photo to sit proudly on your mantle. Plan a trip to Corning this summer. Consider becoming a member. With membership, you get free admission and exclusive offers, not just sales, but invi invites to different events that we have. We host events all the time here at the museum. We offer special demonstrations this summer, too. So come on out and see us. If you think, boy, I'm not going to be able to make it this summer, consider becoming a member. Support the museum, support artists like Jeff, like Jim, working and collaborating together on this beautiful project that will be on display at Art Basel in Miami. That's coming up end of November, beginning of December. I don't have the exact dates. All right, well, we're about to load this gorgeous and beautiful, not to mention huge piece, into the annealer. Jason's working on the, the cane, so I'm going to help out, get off the mic for a minute. Again, thanks so much for joining us on this beautiful Sunday, and we'll be right back.
All right. Amanda, are there any questions online that we can answer while we have a little break? We've got a little break between pieces here as we set up the one cane roll up and we take the leftover glass and actually create another piece. Maybe there's a question online that we can answer. This is Amanda. She controls the, uh, she's at the helm of our, of our live streams and she's the one you're always asking questions to. So we want to thank Amanda. Thanks so much for helping out. Thanks, G. Uh, so what is on the bottom of the annealers? Well, on the bottom of the annealers, um, I, I think they, are they talking about perhaps the, what we have is a little blanket of fracks, it's called. Now on the very bottom of the annealers, when you open up the annealers, it's, it's more or less soft brick. So there's just bricks that line the, the ovens. They're electric ovens. So there's elements, little coil elements. Think of a kind of a toaster oven. Now on the bottom of the oven, to protect those bricks, we actually put kiln shelves. And kiln shelves are a heavy, thick ceramic shelf. Think about like maybe a pizza oven. When you go to the pizza shop and they've got that brick in there, that kiln shelf on the bottom, well, we put that in there. A piece like these that we have, what we did in addition to that heavy brick there, that kiln shelf, we've actually put a little bit of fiber frax. And fiber frax is a blanket that'll soften. When we set those down, it'll kind of soften it from that brick. If they move around or even slide a little bit, they're not going to scratch the glass. Very important for a lighting fixture for any piece of glass, but very important for a project like this. And it helps insulate it as well. Fiber frax, it's called. It's actually like a woven glass. And it looks like a blanket. Um, it, it's a little bit, if you think about insulation, you know that pink fuzzy insulation that you put up in your attic or something? It can be a little itchy. And we have that thing as well. That can be a little itchy, so you try not to get it on yourself, but it's a great insulation, and it softens the glass when you set it on there to prevent any scratching. So it's great stuff to have, and we've been using it in the bottom of the ovens all week long. All right, another one. How are they making the cane patterns so dense? How are they making the cane patterns? Well, let's talk to Jeff about that. Jeff, we have a question online, and it just talks about the cane patterns. The question is, how are you making the cane patterns? The canes are um, uh, kind of pencil size pieces of glass that are white and then picked up on the outside of a piece like these guys are making and then pulled into a long uh, rope shape and twisted. So this has got three pieces of cane on it. This has an interior of cane and then some other one. So it's um, tiny pieces of white, basically, that then blow up into the piece. So this is mostly clear and then white. Now, you said earlier that there's probably, you have maybe 15 or 20 different styles of cane. How many different styles per piece? Are you putting, you know, one style only or are you mixing and matching? How many different styles would you say you're making per piece? There's a variation. I started with some that were very kind of traditional um, Venetian that you'll find in uh, the museum. There's patterns that you'll see a lot in the old Murano glass. And then now I'm starting to kind of mix and match and then we're putting it in a mold and twisting it so it'll make it even more kind of movement and organic. Um, Fantastic. A lot of variation. So they started off a little kind of simple and with the evolution of the piece has come the evolution of the color pattern. And it looks like Brad's getting a great shot of all those different canes on there. Now what I find as a glass making in, uh, as a glass maker interesting is that the thickness of them varies and that makes it very difficult for the glass maker. In this case, we've got Jason rolling up those canes, Jimmy inflating those canes. Now they're all a little different. So some are thick, some are thin, and that can have a big effect on the way the piece inflates. And I'm sure that Jeff's working with that when he sees it inflating, he's probably pressing in and, and denting the piece in ways to highlight and accent those different styles. Is there anything that you're looking for in particular? I, I've just been over there kind of watching and you're, you're pressing and you're denting. What are you looking for when you're, when you're putting that artist touch on your piece? Well, they're going to be sets of pieces. So where the dents are, there's gonna be another one kind of nesting together. So imagine five or six together kind of um, nesting together. But I'm really kind of just working with um, gravity and the heat of the glass and kind of letting the glass design itself. Um, letting it decide like how hot it is, how thin, 
and just kind of having it happen, but trying to make it kind of different every time. The idea is to have no one piece that's the same. All right, fantastic. Now, you said there'll be sets of maybe five or six of them together. Um, this, obviously, this work won't be completed for a little bit of time. Where can we go, the, both the audience here, the audience online, where can we go and see this work once it's complete? This will be shown in uh, Art Basel, Miami this year. So my gallery is our 20th century, and they're going to show probably all of them in one room. Uh, are we going to get a sneak peek online through any of your social media? I, well, my gallery does that. Um, it's R and Company, and they, you can see all of my work online as well if they wanted to. Yeah, randcompany.com. All right, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be checking it out right now. I know I'll be checking it out uh, very soon, so we're looking forward to that. Excellent. Thank you for your time. All right, Amanda, looks like we've got about one minute before I've got to jump off and start helping. Are there any other questions? No, but I just looked at their Instagram. That's a ah, you just checked out their Instagram, R and Company NYC. Fantastic. So, yeah, we're looking at some of those pieces right now, some of those beautiful lights, thick and thin glass, bright to dark, beautiful shadows. Yeah, you have to check it out yourself. R and Company NYC, that's their handle on Instagram. Check it out. What about from the crowd? Are there any questions from the crowd? You folks have been watching this firsthand. Beautiful, wonderful demonstration this Sunday morning. Question from the crowd. Yeah, how did you get those lines in there? That's a great question. Yeah, all of this work will be on display at Art Basel in Miami. Art Basel, a place to check it out again. Check out. R and Company, NYC, for a sneak peek and a preview of all the work that's being made throughout uh, Jeff's and Jim's career here, all through their their different styles. All right, now this is pretty amazing. You might think, well, they just had a piece. How did they make a piece so quickly? We see Jeff squeezing and pressing in. Now this is a much smaller scale. This is actually all of the leftover glass, what we would call the moil, leftover glass that's on the blowpipe usually gets discarded and recycled, but in this case, all that beautiful cane work, all those beautiful lines and patterns, and they've taken that leftover glass and they're actually able to make a nice sized piece out of it. Pretty amazing, the amount of glass that's on the, the pipe, the leftover glass, we would make it into a vase or a bowl. And that's just their leftover glass, so wonderful. Looks like Jason's over here. Now, you've got the piece all finished up, and this will get gathered on before they, they do the jack line. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. George, those pieces look hot, and they look heavy. You're sweating here. Tell us what it's like to experience this wonderful uh, demonstration this weekend. Well, you know, we do this all the time, but we look forward to projects like this because it's something that we don't do every day. You know, I agree fully. Yep. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this one's going into the annealer, this small lighting fixture into the oven. Left side. left side, okay. I'll get the left side of the door here. They'll fire polish the bottom. Now, when they break the piece free from the blowpipe, like all broken glass, we all think of broken glass. Stay away, dangerous. It's sharp. And that's certainly true with this little broken off area. And so we use the torch to fire polish. Remove any danger. Fire polish and soften those sharp edges. I don't know if we've got a, a shot here. Jason's gathering up. Oh, yeah, there it is. You can see him turning. So he's using all that torque, turning. He'll come out. He'll have, look at all the glass he'll have. He barely fits out of the door. He strips off the excess. There's a great shot. 
You can see the glass just pouring off. That glass is like honey. It's pouring off. Look at the bottom of the bucket glowing red as that 2,000 degree glass heats up. The bucket heats up the water, the steam coming off of it. Absolutely amazing. Oh. Well, there's a great photo going on. Jim's getting a photo with, looks like baby Jim in the shop. How neat. Yeah. We've got the giant bubble here. You can see they're actually cooling down the pipe right now. If you've ever wondered what they're doing, as soon as they come out of the furnace, a lot of times the glassmakers will set it over into this trough. And what it is is it's a pipe cooler. So we're cooling down the glass, cooling down the pipe, rather. Those pipes do, of course, get extremely hot. Now, this is a, a wooden block. This is a great way and a great technique so you don't have to lift up that heavy block. These wooden shaping tools, we leave them soaking in water, and you can see the size of that one. You've probably picked up a log out of the river. It's quite heavy when they're waterlogged. This block, no different. And boy, look at the smoke coming off of it as it slowly burns away. Roll it back and forth. Heating up, again, using that torch to heat the very back side of it. At this point, believe it or not, for those of you folks that just came in, this is not all the glass. We're still going to go back into the furnace one more time. The pieces that we're making are about as big as we can get them. They're huge. They're enormous. And with this much glass, we just need one more gather. Now, before we gather, we have to put in, we call it a jack line. We're going to need a way. You saw at the end of that last piece how we just kind of tapped the pipe and the piece fell off. Well, in order to ensure an even break, we need to put in a jack line, a way that the glass will break free from the blowpipe. So they'll get everything just how they want it. They'll put that jack line in, and once they have that established, that break-off spot, that's when they'll actually gather more glass. They'll gather glass all the way up to that jack line. It's a smart way to work. All right, yeah, we're talking about the different mats. Yeah, that's right. We have uh, different mats that will follow around. We have. Uh, an AV team today during live streams. But during normal demonstrations, we offer demonstrations here at the museum 361 days a year. We're only closed four days out of the year. And for a standard demonstration, this amphitheater holds about 600 people. We'll, we'll make a beautiful vase, a bowl, a water pitcher. And uh, we'll make that demonstration about 15 to 20 minutes. And we have cameras that follow us around, just like the cameras are following us around now. Well, there's different mats and pads. Everybody's been talking about, what are these mats and pads? There's a pad under where Jim's sitting right now that activates a camera to shine right where he's at. We've got a couple of different ones that follow us around. They follow the action around on eight 82-inch high-definition televisions. There's no bad seat in the hot shop. Our hot shop has a beautiful mezzanine as well. I see some folks sitting up there now. Folks that were here yesterday, actually. They came back. They know that the ticket's good for two days. Hey, good to see you again. Yep. A member, of course, gets in free every day. Our tickets here at the museum are good for two consecutive days. Uh, admission is reasonable, especially when you think 17 and under. Kids, they're all free. Bring the kids, bring the grandkids. Admission free for the youth, so wonderful. Great way to bring the family out to an, uh, a museum, see live glass blowing. Of course, our collection is about uh, 45 to 50,000 pieces. I've never counted them, but there's a lot of pieces here at the museum. We see about 400 to 450,000 visitors annually. Outside of New York City, we're the number two attraction in New York State. You've got Niagara Falls, they see about a million and a half people. Corning Museum of Glass, we see 
uh, almost uh, about a third as many, so a little over 400, 450,000 visitors annually. Hard to believe, but it's true. It's an amazing, amazing museum, a museum that would hold its own in any major city next to any major museum. So if you haven't come out to the museum or it's been a while since you've come out, you've got to make the trip. Summertime, great time to travel, great time to come to the museum. While you're here, you can make your own glass. You can come on out. You can make a flower. You can blow through the blowpipe, just like we've been doing here this morning. You can make an ornament. You can make a sculpture. You can make a bead on the torch. You see the torch that Jim's using now? You can use a torch to make yourself a beautiful bead that you can wear around. Maybe you're not a big fan of the heat. Maybe you want to stay away from the flames and the fire. You can make sandblasting cups. You could make a sandblasted cup, a bowl. You can do flame uh, fusing projects. So you can make a picture frame. You can make wind chimes. You can do all types of great things. Come on out to the museum. All right, looks like Tom's over. We need to get a second air hose at the bench. Here at the museum, the beautiful thing about this amphitheater shop. What do you need? We've got it. You need another one? We've got that one too. Just pull it all the way over? Yeah, let's just extend the cord right over. I don't think, because it won't, the cart, our gas saving cart here won't go, I don't think all the way over, but if we're just using it for this one piece, Oh, look how long this cord is. Yeah, plenty of room. Okay, that's it, Tom. That's all the reach. Look at that. Plenty of room. Okay, here comes that fun part where George is really going to inflate the glass. Jason's stepping in. He's going to help turn. We'll use that torch on the backside. Now, they still have to put that jack line in that we talked about, that constriction. Once they have that constriction in, Again, they're going to gather more glass on top of it. I know you're thinking, how are they going to do that? You'll have to wait and see. It's pretty awesome to watch the master glassmakers in action here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Watching inside the furnace right now, you're getting a view from inside the glory hole. There's a camera. Now we get a, a three questions at the museum almost every day. And the three questions are, what's glass made out of? Most of you at home listening, you probably know, glass is made out of sand, silica sand. They want to know, do we ever burn ourselves? And that third question, how do you get a camera inside the furnace? Okay, here they go, squeezing that constriction. Oh, there's a great, great close-up. Oh, man, look at the fire. That is hot. Okay, they come up to level. There's a lot of torque right now. We've got two, three people turning the pipe. George blowing through the blowpipe, inflating the glass. You can see it getting bigger. We've got a shielder shielding Jimmy. There's a shielder shielding the shielder. All that heat coming off. Some glass just broke in the bucket next to me. Maybe you heard that explosion. Oh, yeah. Now I just heard Jason say that this is the biggest one we've made so far. Is the bottom annealer up? Every piece that we make, we need to put it into an oven. And we've actually already filled one of our largest annealers. We're on to the second large annealer. And it's not even noon. It's only about 11.30. We've already filled up. I guess when you make a piece this big, it doesn't take many to fill them up. This will be the fourth one we've made today. Yep, I heard just heard Jim talk about the door. We're going to need to put this piece back into the furnace to take that next gather. Well, getting it out is going to be tricky. You saw when Jason gathered earlier, he barely fit out that furnace door. Barely fit out. 
So they're going to have to, again, go gather. And they're going to have to, I heard Jim just say, he's going to come out square. That means he's going to drag the glass off. The glass will be too big to fit out the door. Well, something's got to give. It's not going to be the door. That glass will come out square. I see George smiling. I think George wants to take the gather. Uh, it's going to take a team to gather on a piece like this. I see Jeff inspecting, looking at the different lines and patterns. Again, all the lines and stripes, that cane work. There's a little bit of opaline glass underneath. So there's a milky white that backs up all of the lines and stripes of the cane. I can't wait to see all these pieces together, illuminated, glowing bright. Okay, there they are stopping, and you see how it's just sagging slightly. It's just kind of dripping a little bit. That glass is cooling down. Now, cold to a glass maker, it's all relative, folks. Cold to a glass maker is 1,000 degrees. So you'll hear them say, oh, it's getting cold. It's still getting to 1,000 degrees, okay? So cold is relative to a glass maker, 1,000 degrees. Hot, we're talking 2,100 degrees, the same temperature as lava. A volcano. You've all seen it. Maybe some of you have seen a volcano in real life. But we've all seen it on TV, that eruption, the lava bubbling in the volcano, flowing down the side as it erupts. We've got the same temperatures here in the amphitheater. Now, they'll use the torch on the very back side. Again, what we call the moil, right where the glass contacts the pipe. You see how that's where they're using the torch? Temperature management, temperature management. If the glass gets too cold there, what happens is it'll actually crack and break. When we're finished with our project, we'll put it into an annealer. We'll anneal the glass. We'll cool it slowly so that it does not crack and break. OK, there's that glory hole camera. We were saying earlier that the camera doesn't sit in the furnace. The camera sits behind the furnace. You can see into the furnace. What we've more or less done is just cut a hole in the back of that furnace. But we protect the camera with a piece of glass called fused silica. Fused silica, same type of glass that they use on the space shuttle windows. You can't just take regular old window glass and put it onto you know, a space shuttle that goes in and out of orbit. We have specially designed glass, and we use it right here in our, our amphitheater. That glass was, of course, invented right here in Corning, New York. Pretty neat. Back in 1934, believe it or not. OK, I see George getting the farm equipment ready. Tom cooling down the pipe. Jimmy overseeing the whole operation. He'll grab onto that and make that final gather. You can see how he lets it drip. He's, again, checking that temperature. He knows when it's perfect. Well, I can't wait to see this. Everybody's ready. There's a, it's pretty intense. The hot shop just got quiet. All eyes on Jimmy. All eyes on the gather. <laughs> he said it's coming out one way or the other. <laughs> This is what the amphitheater was built for. This is what the team is here for. This is the biggest gather ever taken. OK, here it is. You folks are getting to watch it live right here in the amphitheater. And of course, everybody tuned in. The kids are cheering. OK, there they are turning. Boy, Brad's getting a great shot, a great close up. Everybody's got their cameras out. Everybody's taking their videos and their pictures. Oh, yeah, look at this. This is going to be a tight fit. I can see it in there. You can see it, too. You can see it. Okay, it's going to be a tight fit. Whoa, look at that. Absolutely perfect. Let's give them a nice round of applause for that. Absolutely perfect. Now they're holding on to that farm equipment, that yoke. They're going to let a little bit drip off. See how it's pouring off like honey? 
They've got to be very careful. The bucket's starting to glow. I see the bucket glowing on the bottom. They let it drip off. The water's starting to boil. We better get out of there. Better move. Okay, there they go. It has a team operating that equipment. Will they cool down the pipe? It's going to be hot. It looks like they're going to go. That was a huge gather. Oh, yeah, look at the bucket. You can see the bucket on TV there. It was glow, yeah, glowing bright orange. Look at it boil. Okay, Jim's over there with the newspaper pad. Believe it or not, that really is just newspaper. Now they've got this great other newspaper pad. It's actually in a cookie sheet. And they've kind of made this little boat. A little, it almost looks like a little canoe of molded newspaper. They keep that wet. Now look at this. Jason's over there turning it. You can see he's got the glass. Oh, yeah, there they are. Rolling it, smoothing it out. Now this is shaping the glass, getting the material exactly where they need it. Something new here in the amphitheater, something we haven't seen before. So we love working here because there's always something new. Now here Tom will step in. Now Tom has these giant mitts on. They're wool on the inside and Kevlar on the outside. And this allows them to grab right up close to the glass. You think of leverage, right? The closer up you grab, the lighter it's going to be. We've all used a shovel. You can't grab that shovel by the end. You've got to grab it right by the head of the shovel. This blowpipe with about 50 pounds of glass on the end is no different. Oh, wow, this is going to be a big one. That cane pattern inside, the glass glowing. Josh cooling off the pipe, wiping it down, drying it. Jason steps, he picks it up, and he sets it down on that, that rolling yoke. Now, see how much easier this is to carry it around? Smart. Now, they'll use the torch. They're going to heat it up. Jason carefully sets it onto the yoke. Now, the yoke in front of the furnace, you can see how that yoke rolls back and forth. We had a lot of questions about that yesterday. This yoke rolls back and forth. It allows you to heat the piece easily. And you can also see that the, the yoke on that, the head on it swivels. So he sets it down. Now see how he turns it? It all swivels. Now he can slide the whole piece right into the furnace. The fulcrum point, by pushing that yoke all the way up, he doesn't have to have as much torque. He doesn't have to push down on the pipe to keep it level. Everybody's looking at the cameras, looking at the the view inside because it's so special to Corning. No other hot shop has this. There's a great view into the glassmaker's world. Now I see, again, this is Jeff Zimmerman and Jim Mongrain's piece. They're collaborating on this. They've worked together for years. They've known each other for even even longer, they've known each other for a long time. And they've been talking about collaborating on a different design, on a different piece. And so, oh look, okay, Tom and George are gonna use, this is a different style yoke here. See how they're able to pick it up? The crossbar, we call that. Many hands make light work. So, I just heard Jeff and Jim talking about the shape and the size of this one. The last ones have been very round. And I heard them say long on this one. They might make this one a little longer. See how it's inflating? George is really puffing it up. Now, normally when we inflate a piece, we blow pretty soft. And it doesn't take a lot of breath. I got to inflate a couple of these yesterday and actually Jim would say, okay, blow hard, and you'd blow and blow, and you'd run out of air, and you'd have to take a big breath. 
and he'd have to blow again, and actually he'd do that maybe four or five or six times. It was pretty amazing. Okay, so they said they're going to marver it on the bigger marver. They have a smaller, well, it's still a big marver, but this one's a little smaller. Thanks, Brad. And our big marver right here, probably about five feet long, three feet across, inch and a half piece of steel, giant marver. This is a giant piece, so we're going to have to use the big one. Now, they're going to have to work together. It looks like Tom, George are going to carry it over there. They're going on, the, you hear Jim controlling the action. Okay, they, they, step, they step away. There's a lot of torque there. Jim's controlling it, rolling it back and forth, getting it to just the right shape, getting it perfect. Again, this table, it's about five feet long and three feet across. So this bubble is huge, absolutely huge. That precision, the scale. He just asked for a little bit of air. We just saw Jason blow into the back of the blowpipe. And again, you might hear Jim there controlling that, the action. He said, okay, guys, we're ready. Now, they'll either go back to the yoke to give it a reheat at the glory hole, or they'll set it at the workbench to continue shaping it there. Looks like they're going to the, the rolling yoke at the furnace, at the glory hole. We've got Josh opening and closing the doors. And Jim's orchestrating. He's saying, okay, this is how I want you to work it. This is a little bigger piece. We're gonna have to change up everything just a little bit, but this is our second day of making me. Probably this was, uh, I think, Maybe the 10th one, 11th one. We made, it was either eight or nine yesterday. I lost track. And then this is the fourth one today. So we've made a lot of these. This is the biggest one. This is definitely the biggest one. So we've had to change it up a little bit. But if we tried to start this big, I don't think it would have worked as well because now we've got some great orchestration. Everybody knows their job. They set it on the, the rollers there now. Again, it'll take two or three people to just to turn this pipe. Looks like George will be the one inflating it. Jim controlling the action. You heard him say blow hard. Boy, look at that. That is hot. Look at it getting bigger. It's getting bigger. Okay, you heard him say stop. And again, he's still using that newspaper pad just to wet piece of newspaper to shape the glass. Tom and George picking that piece back up. Jason turning it perfectly, keeping it round, keeping it even, keeping it on center. It looks like it should just stay a nice, round, even ball, but that's, that's the experience of the team. That's the experience of Jim, of Jason, Jeff. You want it the kind of up and over there? There you go. Okay, this time Jim has an air hose. Before we saw him using a torch, he's got an air hose. He'll control where it inflates, where it doesn't. It looks like he's blowing on the very bottom. He doesn't want the bottom to get too thin. Okay, oh, they're using compressed air, actually. They're blowing it up with compressed air. See how big it's getting? You're going to have to be careful. Oh, yeah, look at that. Look at that. It's Whoa. He said, keep going. He said, keep going. Keep inflating it. Look at this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that got big in a hurry. That was awesome. What'd you folks think of that? Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so they're getting ready with, Jim's calling it the lifters there. So they're, George is bringing the one end over. 
He'll hand it over to Tom. Now they're going to give this a reheat in the furnace. You might need to, Josh, you might need to open the three doors on that side. Yep. Okay. This furnace has uh, several, it has different types of doors. What you're seeing are the sliders right there. But when the piece gets too big, you actually have to open the three doors in front of that fourth slider. Now they've closed. I don't know if you can see it. Well, it's hard to see anything at this point. That piece is huge and right in front of the camera. Now there's a sliding shield. There's a sliding shield protecting Jim from the heat because when they open up the doors, yeah, you got a great view of it there. He said slider away. Okay, now he's just getting blasted by the heat of that furnace. So he gets out of there quick. Okay, here comes Jeff. Jeff Zimmerman, ladies and gentlemen, pressing. Oh, look at, they've gotten that bubble to the perfect temperature. Absolutely amazing. Pressing it in, giving it the texture. Again, remember, this is the, about the 11th, 12th one that they've made. So he says he's going to heat it one more time. You're, I don't know if you saw that, but Jeff's pointing. He's actually talking with Jim. He said, okay, I need a little more heat right here. This is where I want to press it. This is where it needs to get a little hotter. Wow, look at that. That's got to be hot. Boy, the, we've got the cameraman. Brad's in there. He's in there with the heat. He's getting the shot for everybody. Oh, yeah, look at that. Okay, slider's open. Piece is coming out. You can see it's taken two or three people just to flip it around. Jeff Zimmerman pressing that glass in with the cork paddles. He has a pair of cork paddles. Believe it or not, they're just cork. You can see the smoke coming off of them. He's pressing it, and you saw how he kind of slides the cork a little bit. He knows exactly where he wants and exactly how he wants to shape these. Looks like Chris has moved the steps out of the way of the annealer. The annealer that we're going to go into, it's our biggest annealer here in the hot shop. This piece should fit with no problem. It's a big oven. George is the one that's been loading these all day, all day yesterday, all day today. He'll continue to load them today. And for his own protection, he actually puts on a sweatshirt, and then he puts on, oh, they had to get the heat shield out of the way. He puts on this big silver jacket, and again, that protects him from the heat. Here, you want me to get the slider there? I can get that if you guys want. Yep, George has got to get loaded up. They've got to put this away at the right temperature. Okay. He's Look at that. This glory hole is huge, and that just barely fits in there. Jim hands it over to Jason. They're talking about the temperature of the piece. This has to go into the oven at the right temperature. If it goes in too hot, it'll actually slump. It'll bend. It'll, it'll flatten. Not good. If it goes in there too cold, when it hits that hot oven, it'll actually crack and break. It'll go through thermal shock. Also, of course, not good. Years of experience to know just the right temperature, especially a piece like this. Intricate, complicated, yet delicate. Okay, that's Jason on the pipe there. Now, they're going to break it free. They're going to open it. Uh, they're going to break it free at the other bench. So it looks like... They're walking over. The file is probably still over there unless we've moved it. No, nope, there it is. Jeff's got the file. We use this special diamond file blade to scratch the glass and ensure an even break. So they'll use this file blade not to saw through it, but just to scratch the glass. George underneath the piece in case it pops off. Jim using that file blade. And Tom has the torch ready. Tom hands the paddle off. Okay, here's that tap. Look at that, perfect. They fire polish it. They said, hit it real hard. Get it real bright. Okay, here we go. Into the oven. Look, George has got to climb into that 1,000 degree oven. He said, that's good. Put it in there. There we go, beautiful job. 
Jeff Zimmerman, Jim Mongrain, Jason Christian, the CMOG team. Absolutely beautiful, that piece there. And I think that's probably the biggest one we've ever made here in the hot shop. So an impressive morning. Yeah, absolutely. Very impressive.